Hello guys, welcome to Medical Emergency. Today we'll be talking about measles. So so far you'll be knowing measles as one of the exanthematous illnesses of the childhood. That is, it appears with fever and rash, and this disease is caused by virus, the paramyxovirus, uh, which is an RNA virus. All this you might have learned in biology. What else you want to know about measles? As in pediatrics, we'll see that in this video. So measles, otherwise known as rubella, is common. And it's a serious childhood exanthematous illness. So this is what you should know uh, when someone asks you, "What is measles?" Just tell me in one sentence. It is a common serious childhood exanthematous illness. So though immunization has been started for this disease, the mortality rates have been uh, lowered, but the morbidity is still same. So we will now see the etiopathogenesis of measles. So like I told you, it is caused by RNA virus. Uh, which belongs to paramyxovirus family and it is transmitted by droplet spread so it is a droplet infection where, is, where does this droplets come it comes from the secretions of the nose and throat of the infected people and when does it uh, when does uh, when is this measles infection said to be infectious it is infectious four days before and five days after the rash so if the person is having an infection on 18th of some month the person can have can be infectious or the person can transmit this infection measles to other person four days before this 18th and five days after this 18th what is 18th the day when rash was a rash is seen so four days before and five days after the rash this is told to be infectious that is the virus can be transmitted by droplet four days before and five days after the rash the disease is highly contagious yes that is what i told you uh, four days before and five days after the rash, it can be transmitted, so it's highly contagious. With secondary attack rates in susceptible household contacts exceeding. So, in your house, if someone is having measles, there are more and more chances, there are 90% chances that you might also get this infection. So, the entry of this organism, you know, it is airborne, it is through droplets, so it, obviously, it goes through your respiratory tract. So, first, it enters through your respiratory tract, it spreads through the rest of the body, spreads to the rest of the body. So it enters through the respiratory tract, the virus multiplies in the respiratory epithelium first, then it causes the primary viremia and this primary viremia occurs resulting in infection of the RES reticular endothelial system. So once this infection is established, then there can be secondary viremia also, which results in systemic symptoms. So first there is only respiratory epithelium which is affected by the virus, but once it establishes this infection, it causes the secondary viremia resulting in systemic symptoms as well. What is the incubation period of measles? It is 10 days. So now we will see the clinical features of measles. So this disease is commonly seen in preschool children. Okay. So this disease is commonly seen in preschool children. Infants are protected. Infants are spared. Why? Because they are still having the antibodies they got from their mothers. So they are protected by those antibodies. So infants are protected by the transplacental antibodies, uh, which only declines by nine months. So only after nine months, they also have the chance of getting this infection. So what is the prodromal phase characterized by? Prodromal phase will have the first phase of measles will have been characterized by fever will be there. There will be no reality. So there is fever. There is your involvement of nose. There is involvement of eye congenital congestion, and there could be dry cough as well. The main or pathognomonic feature of measles is always Coplic spots. So, what are coplic spots? They are they are grey or white grains of sand-like lesions, which is surrounded by erythema. So, if this is one coplic spot, it will be surrounded by erythema. Around that, surrounding that, there will be erythema. This is how it looks like. And it where is it seen? That is also important. It is seen opposite the lower second molars of the buccal mucus. It is seen inside your mouth. Where exactly inside your mouth? Opposite the second lower lower molars in the buccal mucosa. So we will see how does this coplic spots of measles look like. So this is how coplic spots look like. You can see white white dot sand like lesions over the buccal mucosa. Here you can see the teeth also. So it is located opposite to the second molar teeth and surrounding each white thing you can see a dark reddish area which is a erythema. So this are coplic spots which is the main feature of measles. So now having seen the coplic spots, let's get into the rash of measles. So the rash of the measles is a particular feature which differentiates rash of measles from 
other rashes, the other exanthematous illnesses is that the rash usually appears on the fourth day. In measles, the rash usually appears on the fourth day with rise in fever. So most of the other diseases, other exanthematous fevers, you might be knowing that the rash and fever doesn't go hand in hand. That is, either the fever subsides and rash appears or the rash subsides and the fever, fever starts. But in this disease, in measles, the fever and rash goes hand in hand. So on the fourth day, there is appearance of rash with rise in fever as faint reddish matter. So rash first, first it appears, the rash first appears as reddish macules, mainly first behind the ears, then along the hairline and on the posterior aspect of the cheek. So mostly on your face. After that, the macules become maculopapular and then it goes to the face, full entire face it covers, then to the neck it goes, it's going downwards to it to the chest, spreads to the periphery arms, trunk, then it goes lower again, the thighs and legs. So in that order it spreads, the rash starts from, we learn it starts as macules behind the ears, then along the hairline, then along the posterior aspect of cheeks, then it goes downwards, as maculopapular, it uh, covers all, all the face, the neck, chest, arms, trunk, thighs and legs, in that order. This is the order how the measles rash spreads. Over the next two or three days this happens what happens then? What about the fading of rash? The rash is not permanent, it fades over the course of the disease. So once it fades, it follows the same order as it appeared. So it was from the face to the neck to the chest to the arm to the trunk to the thighs and to the legs. It fades in the same order as it appeared. And you know when the rash disappears, it leaves behind brownie desquamation and brownish discoloration of the area. So where was the rash? Those areas even after the fading of rash there will be brownish discoloration which will take over 10 days for it to fade. Next about modified measles. So this is one kind of measles which is seen in uh, particularly immune or uh, partially immune individuals. So modified measles is actually better than the normal measles as modified measles is milder and it is shorter duration. Okay, so it is seen in immune individuals. So why it is milder and shorter? What about hemorrhagic measles? Another kind of measles. Hemorrhagic measles is characterized by a purpuric rash. Hemorrhagic. So there is purpuric rash. And also it's nervous self explanatory Hemorrhagic. So there is bleeding. Bleeding from the nose, mouth or bubble. In this picture you can see a child suffering from measles. You can see the conjunctival condition, the redness in the conjunctiva and you can also see the rash. Next, we will talk about the complications of measles. The, you know, since there is rash and other problems, okay, so complications we will see one by one. So first there is widespread mucosal damage and significant immunosuppression. So because of measles, there can be immunosuppression, the immunity can be lowered. You know, there is infection, immunity is lowered. And this is one of the main complications, frequent complications of measles. The other complications uh, are seen, uh, more seen. So measles not always end up in complications. The complications are more if the person, the child is very young, or if the child is malnourished, or if the child is immunocompromised. So in these states, complications are more, the child is more prone to complications. So what are the main complications you see? So there is otitis media, which is the infection of your middle ear. There is bacterial bronchopneumonia. Oh my god, so there can be pneumonia as well. Uh, and the usual pathogen. So, though it is caused by virus, the complications are caused by, you know, complications pneumonia and all. And uh, otitis media. So, it is caused by bacteria. So, pneumococcus, S. aureus, sometimes gram negative bacteria as well. There can be respiratory, not only uh, ear infection like otitis media or pneumonia, there can be other respiratory complications also like laryngitis, tracheitis, bronchitis, giant cell pneumonia, bronchiectasis and flaring of latent and tuberculosis infection. Then the main thing you have to notice is they will always ask you in which exanthematous fever there is loss of tuberculin hypersensitivity. So loss of tuberculin hypersensitivity is seen in measles. Loss of tuberculin hypersensitivity is common following measles. It's also a problem. Then there are also gastrointestinal complications. So we told about respiratory complications. So now we'll talk about gastrointestinal complications like there can be persistent diarrhea following measles, there can be appendicitis following measles, hepatitis or even ileocolitis. And the measles 
can also precipitate malnutrition and can cause gangrene of the cheek. So you know, the rash first step is on the cheek and this measles can even cause malnutrition to the patient or it can even cause gangrene of the cheeks. That is the worst state that you can uh, expect in measles. The measles also have neurological problems like acute encephalitis occurring measles. Uh, you know, but it's very less in thousand, only one to two cases of encephalitis is seen uh, post measles. Uh, and that too, it is most common during the period of rash. So even if encephalitis occurs, it mostly occurs when the rash of the measles appears, not as, not like a typical complication which occurs post the disease. Sometimes, uh, like a normal complication, the post measles encephalitis is also seen, and it occurs after recovery and is believed to be due to immune mechanism similar to other infectious or uh, demyelinating encephalomyelitis. And then measles is also responsible for uniformly fatal, this is very important. Measles are also responsible for fatal subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. SSP is a complication of measles. This you should be always thorough of. Measles can also cause SSPE, which is a fatal complication of measles. Very dangerous but rare complication. Thankfully, it is rare complication. So, occurs only in 1 lakh, only one case will have of uh, 1 lakh cases only 1% will have um, this SSP. What about diagnosis? You know there are many exanthematous illnesses with rash. How do you uh, diagnose it? How do you diagnose it is measles and not some other uh, exanthematous illness like chicken pox or uh, your roseola infanta? Diagnosis is clinical. Though it is uh, similar to many other exanthematous uh, illnesses, we always have to mostly diagnose it in the clinic itself without any laboratory confirmation. Like laboratory confirmation can be done after the uh, probable diagnosis. So it's mostly clinical diagnosis and it may be confirmed by the IgM level, IgM anti measles antibody levels which is present 3 days after the rash and persists for 1 month. So once the antibodies are produced against measles virus, the IgM antibodies which are produced, they will, uh, they will produce only after 3 days after the appearance of rash but it will persist for 1 month. So up to 1 month you can detect or confirm this diagnosis of measles. Then, measles need to be differentiated from other childhood exanthematous illness, just like I told you. Okay, so what about uh, the rash in rubio, uh, rubella? Rubella is measles, rubella is another. Rubella or enteroviral and adenoviral infection, rash will be milder in those infections and fever will be less prominent in those infections. So that is one clue for you. The next is roseola infantum. So in roseola infantum, the rash appears once fever disappears. See, in roseola infantum, Rash will appear only after the fever goes down. But what did we learn in measles? In measles, the rash appears with rise of fever. Both appears together. So this is one differentiating feature of measles from roseola infantum. So while in measles, the fever increases with rash. What about rickettsia? Rickettsia infection, face is spared. There will be no rash on the face if it is rickettsia. But in measles, you know, it starts from the face and it goes down. Then in meningococcemia, the upper respiratory symptoms are absent. Whatever if it is meningococcemia, upper respiratory symptoms, the laryngitis, tracheitis, all these are absent. Also, the upper respiratory symptoms, okay, measles will have what symptom? You will have cough, dry cough, I told you. So, all these things, the respiratory symptoms will be absent in meningococcemia. So, that is how you differentiate this from that. And the rash rapidly becomes pachycheal in meningococcemia, unlike your measles. Then the drug rashes have history of an antecedent drug intake. So if it is caused by any drug, if the rashes are not measles rash, but some other rash caused by drug, the treatment history you will know the drugs the patient takes. The Kawasaki disease closely mimics measles. You know, Kawasaki disease was one disease which closely mimics measles. However, in Kawasaki disease, what is there? Glossitis cervical, you know, glossitis, you know, the tongue will be strawberry tongue in Kawasaki disease. So if that one, the cervical adenopathy, fissuring of the lips, extreme irritability, edema of the hands, desquamation are the distinguished clinical features of Kawasaki which helps us differentiate it from measles. Glossitis, cervical adenopathy, fissuring of lips, extreme irritability, which will be so irritable and there will be edema of hands, there will be desquamation, all these help us distinguish both these. 
have with the treatment of measles? What do you do if a patient comes to you with uh, this uh, disease and you diagnose it as measles? The supportive treatment. Uh, so we give antibiotics for the fever and you have to ask the patient to maintain the hygiene. You have to give adequate fluids also. Uh, then enough uh, food has to be taken. There is to be caloric intake. Okay, and then vitamin A is, uh, so this, uh, this is a mostly seen in preschool children, right? So vitamin A can be given if the child is, um, yeah, or it can be given as a single oral dose. If the child is less than one year of age, you can give it one lakh units of vitamin A to reduce the uh, incidence of mortality and morbidity of measles. But if the child is above one year, that is not an infant, then you can give two lakh units um, of vitamin A. And the complications, whatever it is, it has to be managed according to the type. For prevention, there is, you know, there is MMR vaccine for measles. So that is all about measles. The next disease we'll be learning will be chicken pox, which is very common, very important topic, important topic concerning uh, medicine, pediatrics, and you might have already learned this in microbiology, but we'll have to learn it again. So this is all about measles in this video. Thank you for watching Medical APC. Do like, share, and subscribe.